Arlington, Massachusetts, right after 9-11. Um, it was quite shocking to um, those of us who lived near this house. But basically, there was a house um, owned by a wealthy family that claimed to be related to the Saudi royal family. And it turned out that in this house, a young woman was being held as an unpaid servant. Um, and the family, in real life, I think it somehow convinced her that they controlled her visa, that she wasn't here legally. But, you know, this is actually, I've done research, and more so than you would think, things like this happened with immigration. Um, but, of course, it being right after 9-11, it was fraught with a lot of other things. And so the triggering incident, um, you know, probably some of you are writing students that kind of made me write this novel. And as um, Kevin mentioned, I'll be reading from this at more length tomorrow um, at the university. But... Um, Believe it or not, um, in Halloween, on Halloween of 2001, this was like weeks after the attack, this family that lived in the big house where the woman was being held contained many teenage boys who were often running around doing all sorts of things in the neighborhood. And they came trick-or-treating in our neighborhood, dressed, in their own words, as a terrorist and a dead American. So that was, you know, in the context of, you know, post 9-11, and you were saying everything is so, you know, freighted with that. And in my book, I loved how you described it, you know, everything is not as it seems. I mean, everyone has this in mind, you know, that's one thing, things are not as they seem. But in my imagined version of this story, a teenage boy named Josie um, discovers this girl, in my version, it's, she's younger, really, she's, she's a young woman. And so this is the scene where he kind of discovers her and her situation. And the, the thing that triggers him to start watching this house is that Halloween incident. So they, these trick-or-treaters have come to his door. He knows they live in that house. And so I was just going to read the scene. He and another boy named TJ have been, after 9-11, been sort of watching this house. And, you know, of course this novel deals with prejudices and all sorts of misunderstandings and mayhem that erupt, um, partly from the post-9-11 mindset. Not to mention the raging hormones of a 16-year-old <laughs> or 15-year-old boy. And that was another of the challenges writing-wise that I took on in this book, um, was writing from the point of view of a teenage boy. And um, an excerpt from this book is in an anthology that's coming out called, with the racy title, Men Undressed, Women Writers on Male Sexual Experience. <laughs> so I hope you don't mind if there's a little of that in here, because actually it does kind of tie in, you know, with his motivation to try to rescue. And in my mind, Josie, the boy, um, is sort of in a blundering, all-American way. He sees himself as trying to rescue this girl. There are other ways of looking at what happens eventually, so it's one of those morally fraught things. Okay, so this is in the voice of Josie, um, right after the trigger treatment. So the day after Halloween, after school, I biked down to Mystic and waited behind the blossomless hydrangeas for TJ. I was bursting to tell him about Halloween night, how it practically proved what we'd suspected all along about the house. When I heard the whoosh of his mountain bike tires, I thought my wide, braces-revealing smile. The bushes rustled. TJ halted beside me, breathing hard, slipping off his black skull and bones helmet. He was wearing his It Must Suck to Be You t-shirt. <laughs> What's up, Joe? He mumbled into the bare branches. Lots is up, I told TJ, breathing his sweat. Even in the chill November air, he rode his bike so hard, like he'd been as eager to see me as I was to see him. Before I could say why, they call this house the terrorist cell. The terrorist cell garage doors wind open. The must-be Arab lettering on the outside folded neatly up and away. The women came out in their usual head shawls. The most bosomy one dragged at her sides two single-bed mattresses. These she dumped in the knee-high grass. The women stood around the mattresses wielding brooms. Whoa, ho, TJ muttered like they might attack us. He snorted. The women beat the mattresses. I shifted feeling a hard-on inside my zipped jeans against my bike seat. Not that these old-as-mom women in their shapeless robes were sexy to me. Not that I had any control over my hard-on. I tried to snort like TJ, but it came out a cough. I watched the women gripping those brooms with their strong-looking hands. 
My hard on felt like a broom handle. <laughs> Finally, they finished, my hard on beginning to deflate as mysteriously as it had swelled up. God, would I ever be able to control it, use it like a real man? <laughs> the women trooped inside companionably. The garage door stayed half open, half the black Arab-like lettering on display. I leaned toward TJ, who was picking one of his zits. Know what those boys dressed up as last night? Huh? You seen them last night? TJ lowered his hand. I gave a chin jerk nod. TJ's blonde eyebrows rose when I described in whisper the boys in their gutra, I'd looked up the word online, and blood-stained bandage getup. And a dead American? TJ repeated in whispered disgust. Then he spat into the bushes. A few dried leaves shivered. What they want us to be, TJ shook his spiked head, dead and all. He jerked his head toward the other side of Mystic, the upwardly climbing rows of houses on Riverview, where Joseph was. TJ lived in the more crowded East Arlington. Still, he didn't seem to see me as weak, spoiled. Dead to the world, I echoed, like we were the only ones who weren't, who knew what was really going on. We'll all be dead for real, lest someone does something. TJ turned toward the half open garage. Come on. Before I could think, overthink, Dad says of me and Mom, TJ and I were ducking our heads. We crept together around the bushes, the only barrier to the yard. Come on, TJ commanded again over his bigger than my shoulder, like I'd be the one to wimp out. So maybe he did see me as me. We scurried down the driveway. It was TJ who hesitated, standing in his hydrangea bush hunch beside the garage. So I went first. I bent double, ducked under the door. The garage floor was white concrete, stained with oil, like any garage. I scrambled to my feet, panting alone in the dim two-car with no-car garage. Was TJ coming at all? I wondered in a mix of pride and panic. I went first, I imagined saying to my dad, though I couldn't tell him, or could I? Wasn't this the sort of thing he'd been waiting to hear from me? Some exploit, some adventure, some proof I was no mama's boy? I stepped blindly forward, blinking in the dimness. As my eyes adjusted, I saw, mentally, I took notes like a real spy. Piled boxes labeled insulin, Metal devices that looked medical, and the infamous plastic U.S. air delivery bins piled in one corner, neatly. A regular door leading inside stood ajar, a gleaming tile floor visible. A kitchen? I inched back toward the garage door, not sure if I was going to duck out and flee or drag T.J. in with me. T.J.'s harsh whisper halted my edging step. Dude, dude, something's happening out here, he stage whispered through the low garage door opening. They're on the fucking roof. Fuck, I whispered back. On the roof? Like snipers with rifles? I dropped to my knees on cold, oily, sticky concrete. I peered under the garage door to see boys swooping down from above. Rough thumps and gasps and laughter. Their sneakered feet bounced <coughs> on the freshly beaten mattress. So they jumped down from the single-story roof to catch us? Hey, yo, pig, you off of here, pig. A boy shouted, sounding startled. Gracelessly, TJ scrambled into view. He booked up the sloping driveway, lunging toward the bushes where our bikes were parked, ditching me. The skinny boy bounced off the mattresses, racing after TJ. Pig, pig, you off of here. Out of here, did they mean? How would I get out of here? I bent lower, still kneeling, when a light hand touched my shoulder. I jerked upright, wobbling on my knees. No hurt, no hurt, the girl begged, holding up small but womanly hands. She wouldn't hurt me, or I shouldn't hurt her. Standing on my knees, I met her stare. She was so short, girl-sized, but with real breasts poking out under her blank t-shirt. Was she maybe 15, 16? Her round face was slashed by bright, watchful eyes. Her black bangs cut at a jagged angle. Kind of cool, those bangs. Her mouth peachy pale and soft-looking. Her lips half open, showing big front teeth like mine. Kind of cute to me, this girl. Not Arab, but Asian, but why? What was she doing here? She jerked out one thin arm, bravely, like a shy girl. She shoved a folded note into my hand. With her head bowed so her angled bangs hid one eye, she whispered one word, so soft I wasn't sure. Please. Then a commanding woman's voice called from the kitchen. One, one. The girl spun around, her ponytail bouncing. I wanted to grab that shiny ponytail, pull her back, look at her some more, try to tell if she was a girl or a woman, brash or super shy or both all at once. 
but she slipped across the garage, shut the door behind her. She left me sealed in double dark. Too dark now to read the words on her note, except to see they were sloppy block printed in English. Outside the garage, the boys were jabbering in English too. Again, go again, a soft voiced boy called, and sounding like any boy anywhere, race you. So they run away, and I'll just give you the girl's note. This is her voice, and this is what I'll end with. So he goes to um, a parking lot where I could read her note alone, where TJ couldn't see that note or my shaking hand. And here's her note. My name, Lei Tay Wan. I am Vietnam of birth. I am called one. My family of high esteem but fall into need. I am more of work to the prince and family but not of pay. Money nothing here and I have fall in need. All kindness much I pay back. Thank you.